namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Over the past few weeks, we've been discussing suttas, which, as I said, pave the way to a, what I call a deeper perspective on the world, and which lead into the life of renunciation. These are suttas which highlight the unsatisfactoriness or inadequacy in sensual enjoyment, in material of physical existence, in the life of feeling, aesthetic enjoyment, the especially the suttas and the Sangyutta Nikaya, which dwell upon the in, intrinsic misery of samsara, the flawed nature of all conditioned formations. And so those suttas lead us in our sequential presentation of the teaching from the suttas which extol, the teachings of the Buddha which extol a virtuous life within the world, they lead us towards those teachings which emphasize deliverance or liberation from the world. And now we come, in today's class, we will discuss two short suttas which show wrong attitudes to take on the part of those who enter upon the life of renunciation aimed at liberation or deliverance. One of these concerns with one of these suttas is concerned with a wrong intellectual attitude, the other is concerned with certain attachments which might crop up crop up in the process of spiritual development and keep a person stuck at lower levels of, of development instead of moving on to the ultimate aim of the spiritual life. Okay, the first of these suttas is very well known and probably all of you have come across at least part of it in your readings on Buddhism. This is the shorter discourse to Malankya Putta. Maji Manikaya Sutta number 63, Chula Malankya Sutta. The Sutta is famous for its simile of the poisoned arrow, which we will come to in time. Okay, the Sutta centers around the reflections of a certain monk whose name was Malankya Putta. And so one time when he was alone in meditation, certain thoughts arose in his mind. Here on page 533, he, he reflects that there are certain speculative views that have been left undeclared by the Blessed One, by the Buddha, set aside and rejected by him. Then he's going to enumerate these views. And these form a set which recurs very often in the suttas. They are called as a set the ten undeclared points. And they fall into four sets. Sometimes the ten are elaborated. The first three, which are presented here simply as a pair, a contrasting pair, they can be expanded into a tetrad so that we can get 14 undeclared points. I think in the northern scriptures, maybe the Agamas, you always get 14. Is that the case? But anyway, in the Pali text, usually we get 10, but occasionally they're elaborated into 14. And these were issues that were considered extremely important by the Buddha's contemporaries. So all the, or at least most of the philosophical communities that had 
emerged in India during the Buddha's time would hold views, fixed views, about these different theses. And each community, each philosophical circle would define itself by the stand that it takes upon these controversial issues. And what was peculiar to all of the Buddha's contemporaries, leaders of the different philosophical groups and their followers, is that the Buddha himself did not take a stand on these issues and in fact decisively rejected all of these questions as misleading and futile. Okay, the first pair of contrasting views is the view, one, on the one hand, the world is eternal. On the other, the world is not eternal. The second, that the world is finite and the world is infinite. The third pair the soul or life principle and the body are the same. And then its opposite, the life principle or soul is one thing and the body another. And then we come to four views on the after-death state of a Tathagata. That's a liberated one. One is that the Tathagata exists after death. The next, the Tathagata does not exist after death. The third, the Tathagata both exists and does not exist after death. And fourth, the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist after death. And actually, most of these views cluster around two basic opposing philosophical perspectives and they're just variations on these two basic opposing perspectives in regard to different issues. The basic polarity, basic distinction, basic opposition and then the terms in which these two opposing views define themselves, we call the content or subject matter of the views, is the status of the world, the self, and the liberated person, or Tathagata. And often in the text, the word Tathagata is used by the Buddha to refer to himself. He calls himself the Tathagata. But these views about the Tathagata existing after death or not, these were held by other thinkers at the time. So they obviously didn't mean the Buddha himself as an individual person, but rather they were using the word Tathagata to mean any enlightened or liberated person, whether he's a follower of the Buddha's Dhamma or their own teachings. But the basic controversy is what happens to an enlightened person after death, does he exist or not? Okay, so with regard to the world, the eternalist will say the world is eternal, everlasting. The annihilationist will tend to say that the world is not eternal. It will have some ultimate end. Perhaps we'll have some ultimate end. Then the one view, it's a, a, contra, a pair of views, a little difficult to sort out in relation to this contrast. The world, whether the question whether the world is finite or infinite. But I think that there would be a tendency for the view the world is infinite, that's infinite in spatial extent, to go along with the eternalist and the view that the world is finite for that view to align itself with the annihilationist. Okay, then the third pair concerns the nature of the life principle. In Sans Pali, Sanskrit is called Jiva.
So the eternalist will say that the life principle is something intangible, um, intangible, a spiritual essence which comes into the body, which imparts life, vitality, consciousness to the body, or sentience to the body. And that life principle is not reducible to physical phenomena, but it's an eternal entity which temporarily inhabits one body, then when this body dies, the life principle or soul will pass on to a new physical body, and so from life to life it will continue, remaining the same, retaining its identity. The annihilationist will be basically a materialist. He says the life principle is something that arises from the physical processes themselves in the terminology of those days, from the interaction of the four elements. Today we would say through the biological processes, physical processes, and out of these chemical processes, life emerges. And so life is ultimately just a matter of getting the right chemistry together. And so then when the body dies, everything finished, the life principle is extinguished, and consciousness comes to an end, and nothing continues after death. <clears throat> okay, then with regard to the status of the enlightened person or liberated person after death, the eternalist regards the essence of the liberated person to be some kind of spiritual entity, like the soul or self. And so... The eternalist will hold that when the enlightened one dies, then the body disintegrates, but the spiritual essence will remain. And so in that sense, the Tathagata exists after death. Now, somebody with the annihilationist leaning, it seems that they could even recognize that a rebirth will take place in the case of unenlightened persons. So they will have some, maybe some spiritual entity which is reborn from life to life. But when one becomes enlightened, then that spiritual entity comes to a complete termination, complete end, complete extinction. And then nothing remains after death. But then there were some philosophers of this period who refused to accept either of these alternatives as being sufficient in itself and they tried to work out some compromise position which draws some elements from the eternalist, some from the annihilationist. So they might hold, for example, that the ordinary mental processes of the enlightened person come to an end but there remain some eternal, infinite consciousness. And then that is the, in that sense, because the ordinary mental processes come to an end, we say that the Tagata does not exist after death, but because this infinite, eternal consciousness still remains, then in that sense, the Tagata does exist after death. <laughs> So the Tathagata both exists and does not exist after death. Then there were other thinkers. These, I think, would be the skeptical thinkers who say that, argue that there's no grounds on which we can maintain, no convincing grounds on which we can maintain that the Tathagata exists after death and no convincing arguments by which we can refute the existence of a Tathagata after death. This is an issue which just lies beyond the sphere of reason. All the reasons that might be advanced for one decision or another are beset with flaws, with inconsistencies, and so we can never really come to any certainty about solving this issue. And so they would take the position 
Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist after death. Okay, so this Malankya Puta must have been not the very, not a, a dumb person. He would have had some philosophical sophistication. Probably before his ordination, he would wander from one of these, he would wander to the different parks where the wanderers would meet. He would question them about their positions. He was stimulated by their different views. And he would think, ah, now I'm learning this doctrine from this teacher. Oh, so impressive, so convincing. Then he would go to meet another thinker and he would present a counter-argument and present his position. Then he would be convinced by that one. And this way he was always, he was a type who always liked this intellectual entertainment. Then, at a certain point, he would have met the Buddha and he would have perhaps been very impressed by the clarity, directness, pragmatic nature of the Buddha's teaching. And so he would have renounced the world and become a monk under the Buddha. But after becoming a monk, still these questions came up in his mind. He wasn't able to lay them aside. And then he reached a point that he became completely completely disenchanted with the Buddha. He thought, well, the Bhagavan, the Blessed One, he hasn't explained these matters to me. And I just can't stand, I can't accept, I can't accept the fact that he won't explain them. And whenever I ask him, he's always being so evasive, he just refuses to answer. So now he decides, I'm going to go to the Buddha and I'm going to give him an ultimatum. I say, Venerable, (laughs) you want me to continue as a monk with you, then you're going to have to answer these questions. If you don't answer, I give you your robe back, and I'll go back to the park and I'll join the other thinkers. I can resume my intellectual discussions with them. Okay, so one evening then... I can imagine Malankya Puta had some trouble getting up his courage. Maybe it took, it's the way I see the scene. <laughs> it might have been extended over three or four days. The first day he goes, he thinks, I'm going to tell the Buddha, give him my ultimatum. <laughs> he sees the Buddha is alone. He thinks, <laughs> well, I'm getting a little tired. Maybe it's not a good time to ask him. And so he goes on, maybe the next night he sees some lay devotees are talking to the Buddha and thinks, instead of waiting around for them to leave, he uses that as a pretext and goes back back to his cottage or back to his hut. So, But finally he comes up to the Buddha and tells him what he was thinking. And he says, very direct terms, If the Blessed One knows the world is eternal, let him tell me that this is the case. If the Blessed One knows the world is not eternal, let him declare that to me. And so for each of the other positions. And then he says, If the Blessed One does not know the world is eternal or the world is not eternal, then it is straightforward for one who does not know and does not see to say, I do not know, I do not see. And then the Buddha now says to Malankya Puta, <laughs> Come now, Malankya Puta, did I ever say to you, Come lead the spiritual life under me and I will explain to you that the world is eternal or the world is not eternal and so on. And did you tell me before you joined the order, did you say, I will lead the spiritual life under you on the condition that you will declare to me the world is eternal and so forth. And again, Malankya Putta has to say no. And so now the Buddha speaks to him very sternly and says, since that is the case, misguided man, who are you and what are you abandoning? 
and now even sterner term, the Buddha says, if anyone should say, I will not lead the holy life under the Blessed One until he declares to me the world is eternal or any of these other points, that point would still remain undeclared by the Tathagata and meanwhile that person would die. And now the Buddha uses that famous simile of the poisoned arrow. We have a man who's hit by a poison arrow lying on the ground, is badly wounded, his life is ebbing away. Then his relatives see him, friends and relatives, they call a very skillful surgeon to come and remove the arrow and save the man's life. The surgeon arrives on the scene, kneels down, takes out his equipment for pulling out the arrow, and the man says, wait a minute, doctor, <laughs> what do you think you're doing? <laughs> the doctor says, I'm going to pull out the arrow and save your life. And the man says, before I let you pull out the arrow, you or somebody else has to tell me whether the man who, who hit me, was he a kshatriya, a member of the aristocratic, aristocratic class, or was he a brahmin, or a vaishya, one of the merchants, or a shudra, one of the member of the working class, And so then he wants to know not only the caste status, he wants to know the name, the clan, whether the man who hit him was tall, short, middle height, whether he had dark skin, brown skin, golden skin, what was his native village or town, what was the, he wants a description of the bow that was used to hit him, what the bowstring was made of, what the arrow was made of, and so on. And so he refuses to let the physician, the surgeon, remove the arrow until he's accumulated a catalog of all of this useless information. And so if this man kept on for prohibiting the surgeon from removing the arrow until he collects this information, then that man would die. And so the Buddha says, if anyone should say that he will not lead the holy life under me until I explain to him, give him the answers to these questions, then that man would die, but the matter would still remain undeclared by the Tathagata. Now, the Buddha's attitude here, his approach to this question, has generated something of a disagreement in interpreters of early Buddhism. Some, particularly many early scholars, say that the Buddha was an agnostic on these issues, that he didn't simply, that he didn't know the answer, and so rather than come out and say in a straightforward way that he doesn't know the answer, that he simply refused to answer these questions. Others, somewhat more reasonably, say that the Buddha refused to answer these questions for the simple reason that he was a pragmatist, that he took the stand that the purpose of his teaching is to lead to deliverance, and these questions, even though they might be answerable, would, would still be sidetracks which just lead into fruitless speculation. And so they have nothing really to do with resolving the problem of suffering. But it seems to me that there's a deeper reason why the Buddha refused to answer these questions. This, I think that the, the answer is for the solution to the problem that the Buddha was a pragmatist and didn't want to answer them, but that is partly correct. Because the Buddha did put an emphasis upon the practice of his teaching and not 
engaging in metaphysical speculation. But it also seems to me that all of these philosophical positions all stem from certain misconceptions. They have underlying root misconceptions. And so to adopt any stance in regard to these questions would be to accept, to affirm the underlying misconceptions. And what lies, underlies these different opposing views is the assumption, supposition, presupposition that one is a self existing objectively in a world which is external to that self and opposed to it. And so the view that the world is eternal, what underlies this is a preconception that one has a self, an eternal self, which is situated in a world which is eternal. So the world is the field for the activity of this eternal self. And what underlies the view that the world is not eternal is the view that one has a self, kind of substantial self, which is not eternal, a self which is extinguished with the uh, extinction of the body, with the death of the body. And similarly for each of the other views. And I collected a few other suttas from (coughs) the Sangyutta Nikaya which give some support to this interpretation. This is Sangyutta Nikaya Sutta, uh, chapter number 33. One wandering ascetic comes to the Buddha and he enumerates the ten speculative views and says, what is the reason why these speculative views arise in the world? And the Buddha says, it is because of not knowing form, bodily form. Rupa or S. Not knowing the arising, the origin of form, not knowing the cessation of bodily form, not knowing the way to its cessation. Similarly, it is because of not knowing feeling, perception, mental formations and consciousness, their origin, their cessation, and the way to their cessation that these speculative views arise in the world. Then he goes on to say, using a string of synonyms, it is because of not seeing the five aggregates, not realizing them, not understanding them, not penetrating them, not discerning, not examining, not cognizing the five aggregates, their origin, their cessation, and the way to their cessation that these speculative views arise in the world. Then in Sangyutta Nikaya, chapter 44, sutta number 7, one wandering ascetic comes to the Buddha's disciple, Mahamogalana, and says that all of the other philosophers take positions on these questions. But the Buddha, the Tathagata, doesn't do so. What is the reason for this? And Moggallana says, the other ascetics regard the six sense faculties, the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind, as I, mine, myself. Therefore, they take the position, the world is eternal, the world is not eternal, and so on. But the Buddha, or the Tathagata, regards the six senses as not I, not mine, not myself. Therefore, 
He doesn't say the world is eternal, the world is not eternal, and so on. Then, Samyutta Nikaya, chapter 44, sutta number 8, the same question is presented to the Buddha himself, and the Buddha says, the other ascetics regard the five aggregates, bodily form, feeling, perception, mental formations, consciousness, as the self, as the property of a self, but I do not regard them as self or the property of self. Okay, so all of these positions really emerge from the underlying presupposition of self and they all, in some ways, reinforce that supposition if one takes up one of them and adopts it as one's position. But it seems, even though the Buddha doesn't say the world is eternal, but temporally speaking, the Buddha says that samsara, the round of rebirths, is without any discoverable beginning. So no matter how far back one goes, one always finds sentient beings, living beings, ourselves, in fact, (laughs) going through this round of existence. But this process of samsara, it's not a kind of metaphysically objective process, but it's something which is actually sustained, continually sustained, and regenerated from within ourself through our consciousness, through our volitional activity. And again, on the issue, interesting issue of the spatial dimensions of the world, there's a little sutta that comes It comes in the Sangyutta Nikaya, also in the Anguttara Nikaya. It's called the Rohitasa Sutta. There's a deva, a, a god, who comes to the Buddha and asks him whether it is possible by walking, by traveling, to reach the end of the world where one is not born, does not grow old, and does not die. Then the Buddha says, I say it is impossible by walking to come to the end of the world where one is not born, does not grow old, and does not die. But, the Buddha says, I also say that without coming to the end of the world, it is impossible to make an end of suffering. (laughs) Then the deva is very happy with the first part of the Buddha's reply and he says that once he made a determination that he would reach the end of the world and so using his divine power he would travel thousands and thousands or maybe we'd say millions and millions of miles every day going across world system after world system after world system. And he did this for a hundred years, stopping only to eat, sleep, and to relieve himself. (laughs) But even though he traveled and covered so many world systems, but he didn't come to the end of the world. Because the world, in a sense, arises or originates from within the six sense bases, six sense faculties. So no matter how far one goes, one always has eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. And so these are the conditions for the appearance or presentation of a world. And as long as one carries those conditions with one, then there will be a world appearing or present. But the Buddha has seen the conditions that bring about the arising of the six sense faculties. And he has shown how to eliminate those conditions. And when those conditions are eliminated, then the six sense faculties come to an end. And with their ending, then the world comes to an end. (laughs) 
That's why the Buddha says in that same sutta, that's where he makes the famous statement. It is within this body endowed with endowed with perception and consciousness that I say there is the world, the origin of the world, the cessation of the world, and the path to the cessation of the world. Okay, so now, coming back to the sutta, we're in paragraph six. The Buddha says, if there is the view, the world is eternal, the holy life, the spiritual life, the way to deliverance cannot be lived. And if there is the view, the world is not eternal, the holy life cannot be lived. And whether there is the view the world is eternal or the view the world is not eternal, there is birth, old age, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, the destruction of which I prescribe here and now. Here this passage underscores the practical nature of the Buddha's teaching, that the teaching is prescribed or proclaimed for the purpose of liberation from suffering. And answering these questions is irrelevant to the problem of, to the task of resolving the problem of suffering. And so then the Buddha draws the conclusion, paragraph seven, remember, bear in mind what I have left undeclared and remember what I have declared as declared. And what have I left undeclared? Whether the world is eternal and so on, whether the Tagata exists or does not exist after death, that is undeclared. And why is it left undeclared? Because it is anatta-sanghita, unbeneficial, or you could even say useless, pointless, purposeless. It does not belong to the fundamentals of the spiritual life. Adi Brahmacharyaka. And it does not lead to disenchantment with worldly enjoyment, to dispassion, cessation, peace, direct knowledge, enlightenment, or nirvana. That is why I have left it undeclared. And what have I declared? I have declared this is suffering, the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the way leading to the cessation of suffering. That is what I have declared. And why have I declared that? Because it is beneficial, useful, fruitful, and it belongs to the fundamentals of the holy life, and it leads to disenchantment, dispassion, cessation, peace, direct knowledge, enlightenment, to Nibbana. That is why I have declared it. Therefore, Malankya Buddha, remember what I have left undeclared as undeclared, and remember what I have declared as declared. And that is the end of the sutta. Yeah, people, many people know the sutta <laughs> and they wonder whatever happened to this Malankya Putta, the one who asked the questions. Eventually, he did become an arahant. This is in the Salayatuna Sangyutta. Chapter 35, it's somewhere in the 80s or 90s. I think it's in one of the suttas in the 80s. This time, Malankya Putta, he's old and he comes to the Buddha with a question. The Buddha gives him a very concise teaching. He meditates upon it and then he becomes an arhat. Okay, any questions on this? Oh, yeah, there are many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, the Brahmins were definitely on the side of the eternalists. 
Oh, actually, there were... <laughs> good question. There were probably many different conflicting currents of thought amongst the Brahmins. From... Well, you see, at that time, the Vedic literature had evolved into different streams of thought. So there would be the Brahmins who adhered to the old, original, archaic Vedas. In the archaic Vedas, even the conception of an afterlife is not very clearly explicated. But what we could determine from them, there seems to be just a vague conception of a single afterlife, and which is to be a favorable, a favorable one is to be secured if one's surviving relatives particularly the eldest son performs the required rituals the after death rituals and then the Vedic literature had evolved through the period of the Brahmanas it's a more complex sophisticated ritualistic text into the Upanishads which have a full-fledged view of an eternal infinite indescribable self the Atman which is identical with the underlying reality of the world, the Brahman. But interestingly, we don't see within the Buddha Suttas, but I would say a very clear statement of the Upanishadic view. There are some indications that those Upanishadic views, perhaps because they were more prominent in northwestern India than in region of India where the Buddha was teaching the northeast so some of the Upanishadic views seem to have trickled sometimes in a distorted form into northeast India but we don't see them stated very clearly explicitly unambiguously the ten points in any other suttas in the Nikayas yeah one finds them in the sang- actually there is a whole Sangyutta which is concerned with these points mm-hmm. yeah, it's called the Abhyakata the same word here Abhyakata Sangyutta it's very short a very short collection only I think 11, 11 suttas 11 short suttas and then yeah they'll be mentioned actually pretty clear across the, the Nikayas And then in the Diga Nikaya, the first sutta, the Brahmajala Sutta, is concerned with, it doesn't actually take these ten points expressed exactly in the same terms, but it deals with, kind of, it's a kind of survey of the philosophical views of the contemporary with the Buddha, classified as 62 views. But the, all of those 62 views, it said, can be classified into either eternalism or annihilationism. They're just elaborations of those two basic positions. Any further questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> what? Um, <laughs> it does sound rather stern. <laughs> I think he's saying like the input seems to be you're being so presumptuous to think that you, know, you could challenge me. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. No, I don't think it's in that sense, but it's more like you're ready to give up the the religious life without even really having given it a serious, made a serious effort to practice it. Okay, so let us go on to the... <laughs> we take a quick look at the next sutta. It's a short one again, it's a short one. Is it all right? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, this sutta is concerned with somebody 
who doesn't get bogged down, a disciple who goes into the homeless life and doesn't get bogged down with these metaphysical questions and earnestly takes up the practice, but then gets detracted by some other um, obstacles along the way and then settles down without completing the, the practice. And it says in the opening paragraph that the sutta takes place soon after... Yeah, maybe you're right. <laughs> yeah, maybe too ambitious to try to take two in one. Excuse me? Then I have to give the, actually the background to the sutta in terms of... Yeah. Yeah. Not in the same way, but... Uh, I've heard these yeah. hmm. From Buddhist practitioners. Well, confused Buddhist practitioners. Hmm. Uh, so, on the clear point, in our mind, we do not truly understand. We hmm. just... We just take it and, and say, yeah, Buddha said mm. so, and that's it. But we don't truly understand. Mm. 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 That's how I see it. You see, because if we truly understand, then that means we have no doubt yeah. about this. Yeah. And, and, uh, so that means that we're seeing dependent origination. Yeah, if one sees dependent origination, then the views are abandoned, actually. That's right. Yeah. So until we are yeah. up to that point, this is knowledge. Yeah. This is not a realization. Of course, of course. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, another question that I hear, and it seems to be related to and is, uh, what is the meaning of God? Yeah. And it seems to me, uh, as you were going through this, it seems to me that it's also linked to this objective, subjective yeah. viewpoint that you were yeah. earlier that Right, exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that is true. The question, what is the meaning of life, it presupposes that there is somebody that ascribes meaning to life. But still, <laughs> one could say from the Buddhist standpoint that one could distinguish between a meaningful life and a meaningless life, and different degrees of meaningful life. But it's not that there is a pre-established meaning to life. No. When you say this, you mean what is it that gives you the sense of personal identity of being David? I wouldn't say it's entirely illusion. I'd say that it has a certain psychological or conventional validity to, at the relative level of conventional discourse, um, personal intercommunication. We do have our individual identities, personal identities. But this conventional sense of personal identity then becomes the basis for grasping to our identity as being something solid, substantial, and real. And then it is that grasping to the sense of personal identity that gives rise to all of the, say, derivative mental defilements that center around the personal identity, craving for possession, craving for name, fame, position, conceit, arrogance, haughtiness, or else uh, sorrow, grief, when things don't go according to, in accordance with our desires. And all of those defilements, they all center around that grasping to the notion, even at a very deep instinctual level, the notion of self or of I, 
Yeah. What happens after any violence? Oh, no. Ah, the 15th on the clairvoyance. <laughs> Whether anything happens after Nirvana. <laughs> or whether nothing happens after nirvana. Hari or not Hari, what happens after nirvana? It's another great point of the speech. Speculative view during the ancient time. Some people would like the enlightened one to be always pervading mm. the universe. Mm. Some people just accept that what has been done, all is done, and then that's the end of it. Yeah, actually this is the right? issue that defies Buddhists. Actually, this, the interesting point is that Buddhist schools get divided along <laughs> in very subtle ways along the same issues of annihilationism and eternalism. And it's not only a dividing line between, say, Mahayana and Theravada, but even within, say, the Theravada fold, <laughs> I know, like, very learned monks who take the position that, I would say, after the Buddha's passing, passing away of the Buddha or Arhat, there's nothing. Everything finished completely. There's no self or soul that's extinguished or annihilated. It's just the process but the process comes to an end, then after that, nothing. Then, this is a, the opposite position is actually the orthodox Theravada position, is that nirvana is an eternal reality, and what happens is that the stream of consciousness, the process, goes on till the passing away of the liberated person, then in a sense that stream of consciousness becomes nirvanized or it becomes it enters into nirvana there's no continuation in an individual form and no talk generally about a continuing consciousness in nirvana but still nirvana is an unconditioned eternal timeless reality and so one realizes attains merges with that timeless eternal reality so that's the kind of we call the first one a quasi or maybe Buddhistic annihilationism <laughs> and the other position a quasi or Buddhistic eternalism. And I've seen <laughs> monks from both positions argue in the most <laughs> bitter, aggressive, unmonkish language against <laughs> each other. <laughs> Yeah. The answer to these questions no longer Yeah, that is so. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody in the back, did you? Did you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, strictly speaking, you see, it's not said in the Buddhist text everything is impermanent. What is said is sabbe sankara anicca, which means sankaras are things produced by causes and conditions. Conditioned things, yeah. Yeah, nibbana is unconditioned. So nibbana, it's never said sabbe, it's never said sabbe dhamma anicca. Dhamma includes everything. So the conditioned things, those are the sankharas, they are impermanent. But Nibbana is not said to be... The word Nietzsche in the old text is never used. Nietzsche means permanent. It's never used in relation to Nibbana. Maybe because Nietzsche implies continuing permanence through time. But Nibbana is said to be duva, which means stable or lasting. Duva, um, Achuta, Achuta, imperishable. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, I would say that there's a certain correspondence between that way of describing nirvana, nibbana, and certain ways that Christians describe God. But I wouldn't press the similarity to the point where say that what the Buddhists call nibbana is what the Christians are calling God. I say in both Buddhism and Christianity there is a fundamental intuition of some, well, okay, I'll say it, some eternal spiritual reality. (laughs) It's not the world, it's not the soul necessarily that's eternal. Let us say some timeless, stable, imperishable reality. But in Buddhism, it's left, it's never anthropomorphized, never turned into a being modeled on a person, on a human, yeah, it's definitely not a creator, a personal creator, not a being that oversees the world, governs the world, rewards the good, punishes the bad, but it remains as a timeless, imperishable, stable reality, which is the, you call the final goal of spiritual striving. An ordinary word. It's used more for the going out of a fire. That was actually the sense, the older sense, is the going out of a fire. Um, So this seemed to be like the poetic, in a sense, the poetic suggestion of the word nirvana, nibbana. Um, You do have it occasion, especially in regard to a fire. You know, you know, the going out of a fire, because the idea of nirvana that's being suggested, drawn upon, is that of the passions are considered to be the fire that's consuming and burning the mind, particularly, I guess, in India because of the hot climate, and so one seeks coolness as to give relief, release, pleasure. Any further questions? <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, next week. <laughs> Yeah, no, this is a, a serious matter. Of the <laughs> well, I announced this time that I would do two suttas and then I only did one. <laughs> so next week, I'll have to do number 29. But then this is, I have to agree with my very kind friend here. I don't know how to put it in words. Okay. No, I couldn't go on that. Okay, but then maybe 
we'll see, maybe October I start again. So just, you guys, yeah, yeah, yeah. Excuse me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we have to. How I tell the weather lately, when I see him having a headache, I know the weather is bad. It's going to rain. That's all I know. I go to check his room. And I know the weather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he'll go in October. I don't know which state he's going. But he does not want anybody to. Yeah, I think that's better. Because Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. You mean some other books relating to the sutras, no, right? No, no, just, just like a summary. Yeah. Oh, you mean you have the syllabus? Oh, you don't have it anymore. Yeah. Actually, what I suggest is go. Th- you go through all the all the suttas if you have the time. Just go through all the suttas on the syllabus. Then you just have it all sort of under your belt, so to speak. When we come back to the resume the Majima class, then you'll have um, more better questions and. No, I think we have to. I think it's clear that I'm to take a and If I had a tape, it would more clear. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we thank you. Okay, we give them a hand. <laughs> okay, so we have to share the hand. Okay, thank you all for listening attentively. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva nagamahitika punyantang anumodit ba chirang rakantu sasanam. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva nagamahitika punyantang anumodit ba chirang rakantu te sanam. Akasa ta jabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyantang anamodit pa chirang rakant tu mang perhan. E ta vata cha mehi sampadang punya sampadang sa be deva anumodan tu saba sampati sedia. E ta vata cha mehi sampadang punya sampadang. Sabe Bhuta Anamodantu Sabasam 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 Sabe Bhuta